The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. This morning we're, we're doing something new. We're starting a new epistle. It took us two years to get through 1 Peter, and we are now going to start the second epistle of Peter. And so we, we worked through the other one for a couple years, and so my goal is to move at a quicker pace uh, in the second epistle, at least after chapter one. So once we get through chapter one, then we're going to speed it up <clears throat> a little bit. Peter's first epistle, it works so deep in my own heart that I pray and trust in many of yours that as I set out this morning, I have just a great optimism of what God will do in our midst during this second letter. This letter that we'll be studying, it's really Peter's swan song. This will be his last writing. If you'll look in 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm just going to begin reading uh, in verse 13. Uh, Peter says, I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, when I die, you'll be able to call these things to mind. And so this is Peter's last writing. These, there, there's few things that I enjoy more than listening to godly men or women come to the end of a long, faithful journey and hear their closing thoughts to pass on to us uh, as they finish up. And so here's what I have learned, and here's what you need to finish well, last words, so to speak, and that's what we'll be receiving from this great man of God, the Apostle Peter. And so I want to be diligent to unpack and take to heart this great man's final words to the church of God. They're very powerful and they're very instructive, and I believe they could be life-changing for many of us as we journey through this. I've had an amazing season already just in this first chapter of what God has for us. So what I would like to do then is go to the throne of grace and ask for grace. As was Peter's closing exhortation in this letter, he began the letter, may grace be multiplied to you. And he closes it out, I pray that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's go to the throne and pray for that very thing uh, what we need so badly in our lives as we journey this study together. So let's approach this throne that we come boldly and confidently to. Father, we thank you for full access. God, we thank you um, that we are your children, beloved and accepted. And I thank you for this great man of God, Peter, Lord, that uh, he was a testimony of grace. And I pray now as he gives us these concluding words by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would teach us much, that you would grow us in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're asking, Lord, that you would work mightily and deeply in each one of our hearts. Let no one just come to study a book and mark it up, but God, mark us up. Change us, transform us, make us more like that one we desire so badly to walk like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we commit all this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to keep my voice at the same level the whole time I'm battling laryngitis. So my son Taylor said he would kind of lift it up a little bit and we'll keep it there. And I'm going to do everything I can not to raise my voice. But when I see truth, I've got this terrible urge that I just want to proclaim it. And so pray for me that I can just stay balanced and I'll be able to talk uh, for the next week. I'm c concerned. So let's start with some foundational truths regarding this letter that Peter penned to the church of God. And we're going to begin looking uh, at the author. The author is Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so in our last letter, we spent a whole sermon on that first word, Peter. There's just so much there. And we needed to know the man and the journey and how God worked in his life and and him writing that epistle. So we, we labored long. If you'd like to get that, it's 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So I don't want to repeat all of that, but rather I just want to draw out what Peter wanted us to know about him as he penned this letter. And he begins letting us know that he's an apostle, his authority. He speaks for the living Christ. 
What a lofty claim. In Ephesians 2, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles' teaching. And so here he is. He's one of the 12 apostles, Peter. But what I want you to notice, though, is what Peter puts first. What he wants to know about him, you to know about him first and foremost is his emphasis is that I'm a servant. The Greek word is a doulos. I'm a, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, a willing bond servant to Christ. I am the master's slave. I am a, a lowly one first under the king of kings. And there's just so, such a humble introduction. So contrary to the man that we met in the Gospels, who was always so quick to jump out and be kind of the, the, the one with the foot-shaped mouth. And he, he always was the one to speak first and act. And so it's, it's interesting now that Peter, this seasoned man of God, which is what we're going to learn, is how do we grow in grace? Well, here's a man who has grown in grace. And now the way he looks at himself is, I'm a slave of God. This is the balance of humility and authority. So sweet to hear these words come from the man who fought submission to God through his three years with Christ. I'm going to be betrayed. No, you're not. Uh, here, here it's time. I take my sword and I'll cut an ear off. He kept fighting Christ every time he said he'd have to go and die. Uh, and, and then he has these great humiliations of the three denials of Christ. We see this, this thread running through his epistle of 1 Peter, that one of the themes being submission. And so here's a man who lacked submission and what he's learned in his journey with God through his brokenness is to bring his will under God's. And what I am as I write this letter, I'm a bond slave of God. My will has been surrendered to God. Humility fuels surrender. Humility brings a surrender to God. Pride brings about a self-orientation and a self-effort and, and just self-seeking. Well, now at the close of this old godly man's life, years and years of walking with Christ, what would you say about yourself? Well, I'm a doulos. I'm a willing servant of Christ. I'm in submission and obedience and humility to this King. And guys, this is what all of us are at best, we are servants of God, and we are willful servants of God. Amen. Is that not your greatest pleasure and delight and joy? I'm a servant of God. It's said in the Bible that Moses was a servant of God. Joshua was a servant of the Most High God. David was a servant of God. Paul was a servant of Christ. James says, I'm a servant of Christ. Jude says, I'm a doulos of Christ. All believers are servants of Christ. And so here's one of the greatest preachers in the history of the world, one of the great leaders, the early church, the rock, saying, I'm an apostle, but first and foremost, I'm a servant of God. I'm a slave. I'm at the disposal of my king, whom I have sworn allegiance to. We belong to God. And as a slave, we have no rights of our own, just unquestioning obedience to God. And I love this introduction because it teaches us so much to never use your God-given authority to elevate yourselves over the ones that you have authority. You are a servant at best. And Jesus said it well, and Peter learned well. Uh, the Gentiles lorded over you, but we will become the greatest servants of all. So I, I pray that all of you, just even in this introduction, I am a do loss of Christ. Whatever authority you've given me at work, in the church, in my family, I'm a do loss, a servant of the living God. Second point I'd like to look at is the dating of this epistle. <clears throat> Peter's going to die around 65 AD. I've shared with you before the tradition is that he had to watch his wife be crucified and he would not recant his faith. And then as he went to the cross, he said, I'm unworthy to be crucified as my Savior. And he was crucified upside down. He's going to die under the persecution that his first letter warned us of. We, we were looking and learning there's a coming persecution from Nero. And this letter is then now written shortly before his death. And so in his first letter, he was preparing the saints for a coming persecution and how to remain strong and faithful during such a time. How do we be light when the world's squeezing in this hard? 
Well, in this letter now, the persecution is upon them. Peter's looking at what the church needs now as he departs. Remember Jesus told him in John 21, you're going to go where you don't want to go, and he's telling him you're going to die, you're going to be crucified. And so Peter knows this is coming. And so what is going to keep the church strong for all that will come against them in this generation and the ones that will follow? And so it'll be very practical for us today as, as we face false teachers and the throwing out of the gospel in many places and just a complete loss of the understanding of sanctification and our need to grow in it. And Peter will show us what we need to recover in our hearts and in the church. And so this dating is crucial as Peter's about to be killed under Nero as he writes this. Third, then, what is the purpose of this letter? Is there a key? Well, I read it to you in verses 12 through 15, and for the sake of voice, I'm not going to read it again, but he's saying, I'm going to die, and I want to remind you of these things. That's the purpose. I want to remind you of these things. After my departure, he says, I want you to remember. I want you to remember these things. There's, there's air now that's creeping into the church. Peter's going to identify some of them in this letter. One is they're denying the return of Christ, parousia, and the other is that they're antinomians, and they're, they're beginning to have loose living. And, and there's a Gnosticism that's on the rise, and I'll talk about that more as we journey in this book. But Peter's now looking at these heirs, and he wants to put the church on guard. He wants to prepare us for the battle against false teaching. False teachers have been around since the garden where we saw in Genesis 3 where the serpent deceived Adam and Eve and brought destruction. His deception now runs through all of humanity. And it's made us susceptible now to deceit as a result of the fall. And so there's, there's a proneness to deceit, and there's going to be a proneness to those who want to come into the church and deceive. And so Peter's preparing us. As Paul said, wolves are going to come in. They're going to come in your midst. And Peter's preparing us to fight against these lies, to keep false teaching out of our lives and false teaching out of the church. And it's not surprising that Peter will pull no punches. Does that surprise you at all? Peter's going to just, he's not going to beat around the bush. He's just going to jump in and say, uh, these teachers are going to secretly introduce destructive heresies. They're going to follow their sensuality and the way of truth will be maligned. They're going to have greed and they're going to try to exploit you. They're going to indulge the flesh and they're going to despise authority. They'll be self-willed, reviling where they have no knowledge. Their eyes will be full of adultery. They will never cease from sin. They're going to entice unstable souls. They have accursed children. They're going to forsake the right way. And he says they're going to promise freedom while they live in corruption. They're going to promise the church of God freedom while they live in corruption. And so Peter's telling you real quickly what these teachers will be like. And so what he's doing here is genius. He will not so much go after all of their heresies because they're a dime a dozen. They're always, the, the heresies are always going to be moving and changing with new dress, new slants, new twists for all of history. But he says by their character, you're going to be able to spot them. The doctrine may change, but their deceiving character will not. And so Peter will teach us how then do we fight against these teachers? Because the church has been drawn in for 2,000 years. You trace church history and it's just one heresy after another. And there's always this little faithful remnant who holds to the truth. And they'll fight the heresy and the church will be blessed again. We studied the Reformation uh, back in October. And you'll just see that, that, that God will revive it again. But heresy will come in and it will be spread. And so how do, how do we fight this stuff? And Peter's going to say there, there's a key word here, it's, it's knowledge. Knowledge. No surprise that that is being taken out of the church today. Knowledge. The key word in this epistle, it's used 16 times in this epistle in one form or another. Six times we have that word epigenosis, uh, of full knowledge. It's intensive. It's the key to the whole epistle. And Peter's going to say we, we need to know. We, we, we need to have a knowledge of Christ. 
We, we need to have an epigenosis, a full knowledge of who this Christ is, a saving knowledge. As Sandy shared, she had knowledge of Christ, but it wasn't until later <coughs> that she had an epigenosis. And the one that saves you, and the one that changes you, and the one that transforms you, and that's what Peter is going to go after in this epistle, is I want you to have an epigenosis. In fact, if I had to summarize this whole epistle, it'd be in chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, may you grow in it. The grace of God and the peace of God uh, by the knowledge of God in Christ. Grace is the power of God to conform us to godliness. And the false teachers, he said, they're leading you to ungodliness. The false teachers, you can tell their lives are ungodly and it will lead you to ungodliness. And so the truth, the way you'll see, the way you'll know is it's going to be conforming you and changing you into the image of Jesus Christ. And so it's by this epigenosis, this knowledge that's going to lead you into grace that's going to change and transform you and make you like Jesus. Therefore, Peter gives four big defenses against the threat of false teachers that are now surrounding the church. First, he's going to start, and that'll be our first chapter that we'll spend much time on, is to know your salvation. Peter wants you to have a settled, truthful assurance of salvation. And what I'm praying for and asking God is that every believer in this church will have a full, blessed assurance as we just sang and that's what he's laboring for in chapter 1 is without blessed assurance, you're not going to grow the way you should. And if you're here as an as a unbeliever and you don't even know it, what I'm praying is as we go through chapter 1 that God might show you you have no grounds of assurance and he might lead you to the one who can change, transform, and begin this work of grace in your life. And so that's the prayers that are being offered up on behalf of your souls. Second, in 1, 12 through 3, 2, it, uh, Peter says you need to know the Scriptures. They're inspired. Chapter 3, you need to know your sanctification. And then in chapter 2, you need to know your seducers. You need to know who these false teachers are and what they look like so you can avoid them at all costs. So next week, we're going to begin that first section to know your salvation an assurance so that you can make certain your calling and election. And what I would like to do with the rest of our time this morning is I just want to kind of give you a bird's eye view of, of this passage. And we're going to take weeks and months to unfold it because it's so rich. But I truly believe that this section is what Southside Bible Church needs to hear. As I'm looking at it and studying it and shepherding in your lives, this is the section for us we need to get it. We need epigenosis. We, we, we got to settle this in our lives and hearts and understand it. And so we're going to move slowly through it so as to know, to know. And there are, there are a lot of trees in this forest. And so I'm going to give you a flyover of the forest this morning. And then we're going to do another flyover after we look at all the trees. And then we're going to just worship together over these truths. But my prayer, what Peter's after is your spiritual growth. And he's praying that the knowledge uh, of Christ will produce spiritual growth by making certain our calling and election. And so this has to be settled. This could be why you will not grow. It must be settled. And so that, that is where we're going to go in this uh, section to get that settled. So let's start first with looking at all of the moving pieces and uh, some of you know this by now, I love sandwiches. And, and so many times it is, I always describe these little sections as sandwiches. You've got these two pieces of bread, and some people call them inclusios. I like sandwiches. And you see so you've got bread and you get meat, and that's how I'm going to lay out this. I'm going to call it a spiritual growth sandwich, okay? I, I pray that all of you will eat it and delight over it and have full assurance. So it's a, a spiritual growth sandwich that leads to assurance. So... If you will, look with me at the first piece of bread. Verse 1, he says, To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. 
to those who have received a like faith. And then in verse 3, uh, he talks about to those who have been called. To those who have been called. Uh, so you, you've been called by God. You received a faith that wasn't your own. It was a gift from God. And we're going to park on that next week. Faith is not something you work up and mustered. It's a gift from God. So he begins just showing you your salvation's from God. If you have faith this morning, it was a gift from your God. And you were called when you were dead. And he called and he gave you life. So that's the first piece of bread. The second piece of bread, if you'll look with me in verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, the word for election. And so on the end of this whole thing, make certain that God has chosen you, that God has called you. And so you got those two pieces of bread on both uh, parts of this argument. And so very simply, Peter's saying salvation is from our God. It's a gift of God, as they read this morning in worship, so that no one can boast in Ephesians 2. And that will fight off many heresies that have been introduced into the church of God throughout centuries. And so Peter wants you to see that the faith that God gave to you, it did something, something really amazing. It brought you into union with Jesus Christ by His Spirit. And so salvation joined you to Jesus Christ. Christ. And in verse 4, so that you might become, listen to this word, koinonia, a partaker of the divine nature. You can now have koinonia with God. Let that take your breath away. And that's going to do something. That's going to change you. That's going to transform you. And so the way that this can happen in verse 1 is by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've got to have that righteousness. And in verse 9, he says, you, you forgot your purification from your former sins. He prays that you will never get over that your sins have been forgiven. And you've got those on both sides, the, the righteousness and the forgiveness of your sins. And so the million-dollar question then, how do I know if I've been chosen? How do I know if I've been given faith? And how do I know if I've been called? And most people want to put their fingers in their ears and go, ooh, I can't hear you. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to deal with that. That's an eternal issue. You better deal with that. That's the question that must be answered. Uh, A partaker of the divine nature? How do I know? That's the meat. (laughs) That's a beautiful sandwich, isn't it? Better than anything I've ever eaten. And two errors I see in this area of assurance so often is I meet those who have what I call paralysis by analysis and you spend all of your days living insecure, looking at yourself. And have you ever seen those little flowers? You're like, he loves me, he loves me not. And you spend your whole life doing that and and Peter's saying, that isn't the Christian life. And I want to set you free from that insecurity, that looking at yourself all of your days instead of looking at Jesus Christ and being transformed by this divine nature that we have koinia with. And so he's going to come and say, get over that. Every time I do one thing wrong, I can't be a Christian. And I, I want you to quit living in that. You'll never know the power of God living in that. The other error, which I don't see very often here, but I see it all over the place, is when you, wrote, when you got saved, write your, your name and the date and your Bible, and every time you doubt, go back and look at that. That's nonsense. In chapters 5 through 7, he's going to say, if you aren't growing in these qualities, then you're, you're useless. And so what he's going to say is you better be diligent, and you better be growing in these excellent things that are going to show you assurance. And you can go back to your little Bibles and look at those dates forever, and that isn't what the Bible says. And 2 Peter is going to rip it out of your hands if you don't want to let go of it this morning. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But I'm telling you, that's, that's killing us. I prayed some prayer. I live like hell, but I know I'm a Christian. And Peter's going to steal that from you this morning. You look at the Word of God and you tell me if it's true in His Word. And I'm stripping this from you because I want you to have the real thing. Not to be mean. I want you to be a partaker of the divine nature. The answer is 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11 of the balance, and I'm going to give that to you. 
And Paul said, I'm, I'm a minister for your joy. And that's what I'm after. I'm, I'm after your joy. That every one of us, when we finish this section, will have this full blessed assurance. Praising my Savior all the day long. I, I want that from every one of you. And I'm going to be seeking God at his throne, asking that he would grant that to every one of you. I don't want you to spend your life not knowing. And I don't want you to spend your life deceived. John says, I write these things so you may know that you're saved. Peter says, I'm writing these things so you can know. One quick note, very important, that working at your spiritual growth does not get you called or chosen or saved. Hear that. It's not look at verse 5 through 7 and go work at all of these, and if I grow in them, then he'll call me. (laughs) Then he'll save me. That's backwards. It gives you evidence or assurance, this changed life, that you've been called. Because that calling and election had nothing to do with your merit or works. We will see that. Uh, There was nothing in you that caused God to choose you and set his love upon you. All you had in you was enough to turn God away from you. And God turned towards you in grace. Don't mix that order up. Many false teachers have, and they've made shipwreck of people's faith. Don't miss that. So in verse 5, For this reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. If these qualities are yours, and what are they doing? They're increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful. And the true knowledge, the epigenosis of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. Why? What did he do? having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied. Peter's goal is that you would be useful and fruitful in a true knowledge of Him. The most useful people that I've ever known are those who have a true knowledge of Jesus Christ. They have assurance so I can be useful and fruitful. And so hear this out of the gate. If you want to be lazy and apathetic and sinful, it's a big deal. Assurance will go away. It should go unless you have some lie from a false teacher. Then my usefulness goes. I'm useless and unfruitful. And I love you so much to let any of you live in that state. So if that is you, I am coming after you to bless you. Don't fight the scalpel. Okay? You fight the scalpel, it's not good. Let it go in. Okay? Your calling is receive the word of God. Let the scalpel go in and start cutting, and I'll be as gentle as I can. But it's going in your heart. Get ready. So what I would like to do as we begin is rather than tackling who have received a like faith in 10 minutes, I think we'll do that next week. But what I want to do as we start our study is I want to begin a little different than normal is I want to just start with your application now. And I want to get you thinking rightly out of the gate of what Peter is after. And some things to be praying about as we start this series is to begin some examination. It is my focus spiritual growth is that the 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 new born again desire of your heart that's where assurance comes from and so not just am i growing but maybe a a better question as we start a new year uh is is how am i going to grow this year have you given uh, time and prayer and thought to that if you haven't you're not growing are you gonna you got sins you want to mortify and graces that you want to grow in just out of the gate Uh, the the born-again Christian wants to grow. You want spiritual growth. I should be throwing that out, and you guys are devouring that like bread. Just, (laughs) I want to grow. I desire it. And so what I want to do this morning, for those who like outlines, I'm going to give you an outline. Six considerations about spiritual growth from our text. 
And I don't know how I'm going to get through all six. Some of you are praying my voice doesn't hold out. I came across these questions as I was studying the last few weeks from some different men. And I want to share them with you uh, because I want you to hurt with me. So come enjoy uh, what this is doing in my own heart. So the first consideration I'd like you to think about spiritual growth is it's possible. Spiritual growth is possible. And I just want to even ask you, honestly, do you believe that? Do you really believe that as you sit here this morning? Because some don't believe that you can grow. You've worn out and you've lost hope. And you've settled. This is who I am. You know what? People don't really change. I've been justified. And I'll I'll get nothing more except heaven at the end of this. That's uh, that's a lie. That's unbelief. It's false teaching. I've noticed that most of our contemporary songs and our contemporary books, they're always about what Jesus did to save me, and I like that. And then it's, why is it okay that I'm struggling and not growing, and the whole song is just to think about His love and mercy, and it's okay that you're not growing, and it's okay that you're struggling. That is not what we're learning in the Word of God and what Peter's going to tell us. Have you been rocked to sleep in that? Don't you want more than that? God does. Have you just quietly or subconsciously made peace with that you are not going to really grow any more than you are today? Have you just become content in that place? I'm okay with just being lethargic and cold, dead, and never overcoming these sins in my life. Have you become content with that? This is a call to wake up. This, uh, it ignores that you've been made a partaker of the divine nature. The DNA of God was put within you. The Spirit of God dwells in you so that, he says, we have everything for life and godliness in verse 3. Everything, or 4. Everything that you need for life and godliness, he gave to you at salvation. And so this is so powerful (laughs) <laughs> what he's saying, one preacher uh, said this can act in two ways. This truth could wipe you out. Because you finally are sitting here going, I have no excuse for not growing. And I'm, I'm wiped out. Or the other is that this could give you massive, amazing hope this morning. Because this tells me there's no habit that is so binding that you cannot be freed. There's no fear that cannot be relieved. There is no sin, don't get content with it, that can't be overcome. There's no wound so deep that it can't be healed. There's no brokenness that can't be repaired. This is an amazing reality, guys. The good news this morning, spiritual growth is possible. It's, it's amazing what God has given to us. Koinonia with the divine nature, His power, and magnificent promises. Second, this is important, I think, to help a lot of you. It helped my heart. Spiritual growth is gradual. Did you hear that word? Gradual. I pray that that will bless you because it helped me greatly. Verse 8, he tells us if these are yours in increasing measure, they're going to be increasing. They're going to be gradual. Do you remember back in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, where you're newborn babes and you're, you're longing for the spiritual milk of the Word of God that you might grow in respect to salvation. And so it, it's, it's gradual the way an infant grows. 1 John 2, he writes, older men, fathers, and children. So our growth is gradual. You know that you're born uh, again spiritually as a babe. Uh, I have five babies. Well, not now, but we've had five babies, and every one of them came into this world a little bit different. One came in kind of rosy and red. Jordan came in blue, and I thought he was dead. I never saw any of the videos or in biology class. I missed it, and I literally thought, this kid's dead. He's blue. He's not breathing. What happened? Same thing spiritually. Some... The new birth birth comes and you are ready to roll 
and you are zealous. Raise your hand if that's you. Right? We got several in here. And you've been shot out of a cannon, and you do everything. You volunteer. You don't miss any study. You go to a study seven times a week, and it's all you can talk about, and everything is awesome. And you usually become very condemning of anyone as you start realizing not everyone is as zealous as I am. What is wrong with these people? And then you get discouraged very quickly as well. Some come in full of fears and doubts. Doubtful about a lot of things. They need to grow and they need to get their eyes off of themselves and they need to learn that God is trustworthy. And one thing that characterizes babies is they want what they want when they want it. And so many are born into that where we're the same way. I just, I want this. I want that. God, give me this. Give me that. And that's how we come into this world. And anything outside of that messes with them. But they're a real joy, right? Who doesn't love a baby? I love them. And, and spiritual babes are beautiful. But then we grow in stages, and we move into adolescence. I think we're the only country that has adolescence. You know what that is? You're, you're not quite a child. You're not quite an adult. So you're adolescence. And it, it's kind of a funny stage unless you're in it, right, guys? It's the longest 10 years of my life. Uh, it's, it's a stage where you're not quite an adult, but you're not a baby. You're an adolescence. And so sometimes you act like an adult, and sometimes you act like a child. And so we're, we're called to parent that. And it's funny, when a baby cries, what do we do? We do everything to help it and pamper it. And we sing, hush, little baby, don't say a word. Daddy's going to buy you a mockingbird. And when an eight-year-old cries because they want candy in a store, what do we say? You don't rock them and say, hush, little baby. You're like, stop that. You know, if anyone's in that, get, get out of here. You're going to get nothing. And it's not so cute anymore. And God does that with us as well. And when we're born again, the grass is greener, the sky is bluer, and he just feels so near to us. Everything you read is the first time. And now God is going to show you that you're, you're trusting in your feelings and your emotions. I've watched this a hundred times as a pastor. And now he's going to take away that, that, that the grass is greener and the sky is bluer, and he's going to start teaching you something deeper. And he's going to teach you in Deuteronomy 8, will you obey him whether you feel like it or not? Is he worthy of just pure obedience, even when you're dry as a chip, even when you're struggling and you don't understand his ways. There's going to be times that you must mature now to just believe the bare word of God and not be led by just emotion and obey when it doesn't even make sense to keep walking when I'm just spent because God's worthy. As adolescents, it takes so much longer to figure this out. This is a tough season. It was a very tough season on me physically and spiritually. <clears throat> and so God's working in our lives and we're, we're, we're having to learn that. Some of you might be in that right now where he's teaching you those very difficult things of how to trust and, and to go on to this third stage to become mature. And mature is now when you suffer, you don't spend all your time saying why, but what? God, what are you showing me? What are you wanting me to learn? And you're, you're, you're this pliable pliable. Here you go, God. Here am I working my life. What are you going to do right now in this pain? You know that suffering is the only way you're truly going to grow. So we don't run around just saying, I, I want suffering, but a mature saint, when it comes, they, they, they receive it because they know what God's going to do because of all the things they've learned in their journey that you're changing me, transforming me, and I've never had such a nearness with you than when I'm suffering. And so that's where a baby goes from just emotion to an adolescence kind of there and to where we mature into this. And so it, it, it hurts and we don't run around wanting it, but we don't blow it off when it comes. Hudson Taylor, a dear man of God in China, he's giving his life for the Lord and his wife dies. And he bows his knee next to her casket. And he says, I dedicate myself more now to the evangelization of China than ever before. He lost something so dear, but his calling was God and serving him to the very end. And that's maturity, to be able to kneel right down with the greatest thing he loved on earth, gone to glory. That's maturity. And we're blessed at Southside with all three. I'm glad I'm not just running a spiritual nursery. We have 
babies, adolescents, and some beautiful mature saints. And it's my joy to watch God put every one of us in the incubator called Southside Bible Church and to see you grow up into the head. This is how God designed the church to have all these different places and people where we get into community and fellowship and you start to mature and grow and become mature. It's, it's beautiful to watch. So guys, it's gradual. Do you hear that? Please, do you hear that? I know so many of you who don't have assurance because I'm not an adult yet. This is a journey in grace. And for Americans, this is so important because what happens if our com computer takes three seconds to pull up a site? <clears throat> We're frustrated. What a piece of junk. If I don't hear back on a text in five minutes, they're ignoring me. Everything is instant from our oatmeal to our information. And if I don't know something, I just say, Siri, what's this? And so we want the Christian life that way. And you've got to stop. That isn't how the Christian life works. Babies, no matter how hard you try, you can't make them grow faster. When I was a kid, I used to hang on our pull-up bar just praying that I would grow. And it never worked. And I ate double helpings for dinner. And so what I want you to just see is you, you can't make... You just, can't go from baby to adult. So should I lower my expectation? And my answer is no. I heard a great illustration this week. If you took an acorn and took it on cement to try to break the cement, what would happen? It would just shatter. He said, but if you took the acorn and put it underneath that cement and planted it and watered it, the thing's going to slowly grow and get roots to where one day, huh, Robert, it'll just take that cement and boom. Some of you guys make a living off acorns. And, <laughs> and it will just destroy that cement. So I want you to higher your expectations. You've been joined to the living God to have fellowship with God. And there's a power that can take these little acorns as we're born again and can just slowly grow us as we put our roots in the Word of God and the means of grace, and that we can grow up and become these oaks that will give shade to a whole church. This is why you need discipleship. Get around those oaks. Just get around them, follow them, watch them, and learn from them. I better get going. Thirdly, spiritual growth is essential. <clears throat> Verses 10 through 11, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing. This is how he will confirm that you are chosen, that you are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. You will have works. You must be growing. They've been prepared before the foundation of the world that you would walk in them. You're not justified by them, but you've got to have them if the DNA of God has been put within you. Spiritual growth is practical. I already read the list. And verses 5 through 7, add to this, add to this, add to this. This is not pie-in-the-sky theology. It's a day-to-day -day worked out thing. He says, apply all diligence twice in this section. Diligence. Apply all diligence to grow. And so this is not a quietistic theology. It's not, I'm just going to do nothing and God will grow me. Let go and let God, your theology needs to stand up to what Peter's saying here. You be diligent. You be diligent. You've been called. You've been joined to the divine nature. His power promises. We're going to look at how that all balances, but you better not throw out. You be diligent. Does your theology have a place for that? Then it's wrong. Like Paul, he said, I've labored more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. We are motivated by this gospel. Our calling and a choosing, the forgiveness of our sins, it's nothing we did. And now we get to do for our Father in heaven, Christ our Savior. The Spirit gave us life. We want to live for Him. We want moral excellence. Don't you want moral excellence? Be so different from this world that they start asking you, what's the hope within you? And that that grows into a knowledge a knowledge of Christ, and you begin to have self-control. Can you imagine that, an American with self-control? I, I literally <clears throat> don't just chase my flesh and my desires and whatever I want, I do. I begin to have a self-control by the power of God. And then I have a perseverance. 
You mean I don't quit when I didn't change the world in three months? When suffering, you actually stay put? You don't go into self-pity, you don't quit praying, you don't quit reading and obeying, and you don't leave the people of God. Or somebody wrongs me, and I'm done. You got perseverance. That's what this grace will do. And that will bring about a godliness, and then a brotherly kindness. That where this is going to grow is you're going to have a kindness to you that is unbelievable with the brothers in this world. And then that's going to lead to agape. You will have a love, a love now that will say, my life for yours. I am truly happy when your life is flourishing. That can't happen in this world. I have a love for you that all I want to do is see you blossom and flourish in Christ. Agape. The fellowship with the divine nature is going to produce practical, lived-out conformity to Christ. Perfectly? No. Truly? Yes. And this will do what the law could never do, which leads me to my next point. Spiritual growth is organic. Peter says, you'll be unfruitful. And the fruit of the Spirit, it's organic by Abiding by having this divine nature, what's going to come out is going to be fruit. It's, or, it's organic. So you, you're not going to grow like if you have a dirt pile. How do you grow a dirt pile? You throw more dirt on it. Here's some more things. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Your dirt pile will get bigger. But that's not how the Christian life works. It's organic. It's what comes from being attached to a vine, a divine nature called Christ. And as we get the gospel, the righteousness that we'll look at next week the forgiveness of sins and magnificent promises, Peter says, and we live by faith, these things are going to begin to bubble up on the inside to the outside. I'm going to use this illustration later. I was going to talk about the Holy Club with John Wesley. Great illustration. You would have loved it. Uh, So many of you are trying to grow by throwing dirt on a pile, and I pray this morning that God would break you of that. You would quit trying to just add these things in your own strength, do your moralistic stuff. I want you to learn what it means organically to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And lastly, our spiritual growth is Christ. It's so easy to look at these traits that I just read to you in verses 5 through 7 and say, oh, there's my new Ten Commandments. I'm going to go work at them so I can have assurance. I like assurance. I want assurance. I will work at these till I get assurance. I did that for 10 years. It doesn't work. I want to save you a decade. You're going to be a gerbil on a wheel if that's what you do. That's not how it works. You're to be filled with awe and wonder and praise because you are remembering something that you have forgotten. The forgiveness of sins. I think we take too lightly the forgiveness of sins. I think that is the greatest thing. What that testimony did for me She should be in an insane asylum or in prison, and she's this beautiful manifesting grace of God because my sins have been forgiven. I pray that you see how beautiful that truth is. And if you're not growing, he says, you you forgot the amazing grace of God to forgive all of your sin. Grace, the cost for Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, bearing the full wrath of God, in your place. As the hymn writer said, my sin not in part but the whole is laid on the cross and I bear it no more. Oh, praise the Lord. If you're not growing, you forgot that glorious, beautiful truth. Moral excellence, remember what Christ did and you want it. Knowledge, true knowledge of Christ. Self-control is I have everything in Christ. Perseverance, he never quit. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I will never quit for you. Godliness, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father, brotherly kindness and love, no greater love than this, than a man laid down his life for his enemies. Christ, remember. The Lord's table, Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. We can't let this get far from us. We have to fight to remember, to keep this at the center of your heart and life and to hold it and to never sell it. Drift from this gospel and you will quit growing and you'll just start throwing dirt on a pile. It will not be organic. May God in His grace meet us in the study and grant to us life and godliness and diligence. 
and grace that will renew us and cause us to be these kind of people so that we might have a full assurance, which just makes what we remember all the sweeter. And in verse 11, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful, gorgeous word. I pray that you would meet us in a very special way in the days ahead. God, I pray that all of us would experience spiritual growth, that we would learn the way that you accomplish it. I want a bunch of acorns to become trees in this study. God, I pray that you will begin and just do this mighty work, and we thank you for what you've been doing in our midst, and we cry for more. We want more holiness of life. And so, God, uh, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Peter. Thank you for his final words this morning. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.